So I've now started our recording. Good morning, everybody. Today is Wednesday, April the 4th. Welcome to our first installment of the Aperio Teaching and Learning meetings for April. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia. I'll be facilitating this call along with Tricia Gordon, also of UVA, and the fabulous Neil Caden, who will be doing our primary presentation for this call on the new features available in the newly released Sakai 12. So a very exciting development for the Sakai community. And Neil is going to walk us through that, uh, maybe take us through some of the release notes and tell us a little bit about some of the great things that are going to be available with this new release. If you haven't signed into the Etherpad already, please feel free to do that. The link is in the chat. You may need to scroll up to see that if you haven't seen it already. But feel free to follow that link and sign in on the Etherpad so that we know that you're here. We always take a few minutes before we dive into the meat of our meeting to go through any announcements from the community. We always want to take a few minutes to do that. So Neil is with us, and Neil often has the 411 on most of those key announcements. So Neil, you want to come on and take us through anything that you have to get started? Sure. I'll just take a couple things. Of course, we got the 12.0 release, which is what this meeting's about. So that's a pretty big news that you all know about. And um, we're working on a 12.1 release, uh, maintenance release. Um, and we just have, I think we have everything fixed that uh, the core team wants to get fixed to do the release, but we just have to get a little more QA on that, get those issues verified, merged into uh, the 12 branch, and then we need a round of testing. We'll need a round of smoke testing on um, when we get a release candidate out. Um, so if you're able to help with QA, that would be super. Uh, I think that's the main thing that's um, between us and a 12-1 maintenance release is, is QA testing. Um, what else? Uh, uh, just to get progress on the WCAG, I don't Let's see. Is Tiffany on the call? Let's see. I don't so, think Tiffany's on the call this morning. So we we hired, you know, level access it used to be called SSB Bar to do an evaluation of um, our system. We had had them do a, an evaluation when we had a Sakai 11, and then we used that data in order to improve our accessibility in Sakai 12. We they've completed their report, and now we're meeting with them. A group of us is, are meeting with them to review the report and understand what the implications of that report are and what they mean for, you know, our goal of getting um, the BCAG uh, compliance statement and um, or, and or a VPAT, which is sort of a self-reporting mechanism. So that's in the works. And um, special kudos to Matt Clare, who um, no longer is part of the Sakai community, at least for this year. And he's he's also involved in that assessment. He's, you know, volunteering his own time to, to do that, which is really super helpful and appreciated a nice um, so there's a movement on that and when we finish that assessment we'll let folks know where that stands i think those are the two main things i can think of um i'm sure there might be other announcements in the community i know that louise is not on the call that she couldn't be with us today but i know that she would want us to announce that we have Atlas Award winners for 2018. Uh, some of you may have seen the emails about that going out to this various Sakai lists yesterday. But congratulations to Michael Friesen from the University of Western Ontario, uh, Eric Giraudin uh, from Grenoble Alps University, and Kevin Abbott, Alex Ambrose, Maureen Dawson, and Paul Manrique from the University of Notre Dame uh, for their winning entries. So congratulations uh, to all of them. We'll look forward to seeing them and hopefully hearing more about their entries at Open Aperio this summer. And of course, thanks to everybody who has been involved in that Atlas Award process. I know that Louisa has been the linchpin of that process for a number of years, but I know there are many other people who are involved as well in the community uh, participating in the review of submissions and things like that. So thanks to everybody. Uh, for all your involvement and congratulations to the winners and we look forward to hearing more about your entries very soon. Anybody else have any other community announcements before we dive into our Sakai 12 new features review? I'll wait just a second for people to come on the mic or to post anything else that they have in the chat.
Okay, I'm not seeing anything else at this point. If you do have other announcements that you want to pass on to the community later on, feel free to post them in the chat or send an email to Tricia, Neil, or myself. But for the moment, we're going to turn things over to fabulous Neil Caden, Sakai Community Coordinator, who's going to take us through some of the new features that are available in Sakai 12. Take it away, Neil. Thanks, Matt. You really, you really slay me with the fabulous Neil Caden thing. <laughs> like, okay. Um, um, all right. I'll try and live up to that best I can. Uh, you so, always do. I'm not concerned at all. I say. Okay. Uh, so the request that um, folks made uh, was to, you know, review of Sakai 12, the latest, fe the latest release of Sakai. Um, and I did come up with kind of an idea of how to proceed. Um, if anyone has additional suggestions or wants to see something in particular. Um, oh, good announcement, Trisha. Uh, yeah, so as everyone probably knows by now, um, the my position is, is ending uh, by the end of this month and Wilma has volunteered to jump in and, uh, and uh, help fill that role so that we'll still have a really robust team of three um, excellent facilitators for the teaching and learning call. So thank you, Wilma, for, for jumping in there. Um, Wilma's jumping You're into welcome. other um, places, Yeah, I'm places. happy to do it. I know Trisha and Matt do a great job, so it'll be easy. <laughs> yep. It'll be an easy um, add-on. Um, so here's here's what I was suggesting, for, uh, what I was thinking in terms of the structure for, for this discussion is I thought I would share with everybody the structure of the release notes, um, you know, so that it'll make it easier for you to go back and find things, you know, after the call, um, after the presentation. And um, uh, then I thought I would show um, some things that may not be obvious, like there are some things that I think will be obvious, but if people want a short demo, I can give it. So I'll kind of go over the things that are new for Sakai 12, very briefly this list, but those are things you can mostly read on your own. And I thought I would show a few of the features that may not be as obvious what they are. Um, one is um, in Samago test and quizzes, there's something called a new feature called tags. It has to be turned on by a property. Um, there's a new feature called, it's a new tool called the commons tool. So I thought I'd just briefly show that tool. Um, there's a bunch of new widgets and lessons, so it might be good just to be aware of them. Um, uh, so I thought I'd show that. There's a new site info display widget, so it might be good to be aware of that. Um, if people wanted, we can get into a little bit of detail on what I think is one of the biggest uh, thank you, Beth, for putting that link in the Etherpad. Um, one of the biggest features in, in 12 is the um, test and quizzes new extended delivery um, feature. And there was a lot of work done, and I think there's likely to be continuing work done to continue to improve and make more consistent the auto submit and the timer portions and how that works with Samago overall and extended delivery or exceptions delivery, how you want to talk about it in specific. So, um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the IMS shopping cart, even though I don't necessarily 100% understand it, but I think it's good to be aware of it. Um, and uh, and then I, um, let's see, uh, mentioning bullhorns, which is another new feature that's not on by default, and a few other things. So a few little things like that that may not be too, so obvious. And then what I thought might be good to do is to look at the readme file um, to cover that very, very briefly, because it has a, you know change management issues that you'll want to consider for, for your institution when you're adopting Sakai 12. If there are questions that come up from those issues, covering them quickly, um, you know, then we can try and address them. If I don't know the answer, we can try and see if we can get an answer. And then lastly, I thought it might be good to sort of take a look at the um, feature summaries and kind of peruse. I, we try, I tried to create a page that would allow you tool by tool to kind of look at potentially new features uh, for each tool. And I say potentially because um, JIRA is, you know, a great tool and we use it pretty consistently, but it's not, the way we use it isn't perfect. So we're not going to have a perfect set of data, but a very good set of data. So that was my, that's my, how I'm thinking we could start. How does that sound to you all? Sounds perfect to at least one person, to Tricia. Okay. I think that sounds great, Neil, whenever you're ready. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and, and start then. So um, somebody already pasted the the link to the release notes um, in the Etherpad, so I appreciate that. 
Uh, on the release notes, we have a little blurb about Sakai. We have a link to the technical release notes, which I'll show in just a second. And those link to each other, so you can go back and forth between the technical and the functional. We've got a summary, which um, has some arbitrariness. It's sort of like the Sakai story we developed for a new release that's a lot of discussion in the community and in the core team, you know, which things to highlight. It's, it's hard to pick the very, very top ones. So um, we picked, you know, the, I don't know, it looks like 12 to 20 issues or 12 to 20 things about Sakai 12 that we're highlighting um, and hopefully will be of most interest or so to you. And then we have a readme section um, and the readme section is, I'm going to go into in a little bit, um, and then a complete feature summary. And the readme is linked both from the functional as well as from the technical. So if we go over and look at the technical release notes here, um, in the technical, we go into more detail. For example, for each release and maintenance release, we keep track of the date it was released. We have a you know redo of the about Sakai, just general information about Sakai for folks who are, who are new to it. Um, we don't have any current translations in the past. Sometimes we've had translations in Spanish or Chinese, Japanese, um, French, but I don't think we have any translations at the moment. Um, but the structure is there if somebody wanted to create a translation. Um, there's a link to a complete list of JIRAs that have been fixed for 12. System requirements, so this is for doing installations, um, including things like browser support. OS uh, support, the version of Java database. Actually, this needs to be updated a little bit. Um, I think it's pretty close to correct. So things like that. What are what are the the what is the technical requirements of um, running Sakai, both from the server side and the and the browser side, the OS side? How to download Sakai, which is um, extremely important for folks who are not hosting, or even if you are hosting but want to make a development local instance to to play around with. So this gives instructions on how to download Sakai or get the source code from Git on Sakai, how to build it, uh, very, very high level, you know, how to do that, or links on how to build it. And then install guys, which go into a lot more detail of installing Sakai, both from binary and from source. And binary means that's, that we've already compiled that version of Sakai, so you can just download it and then um, how you can run it right from the binary, the more common way that people use Sakai is installing it from source because it gives you a lot more flexibility of doing things like applying patches and making configuration changes. So um, so that's all this technical stuff. And as I mentioned, uh, and then upgrading from older versions of Sakai, which is really, really key. We try and put key notes here about, you know, which for going back way, way back actually, but um, this page we decided to make it really short and say, what do you need to do to get from Sakai 11 to Sakai 12, so we could keep this short. And then we have a link going back for how do you upgrade to Sakai 11 if you're on a version earlier than Sakai 11. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the link to the, to the release notes and also a skin guide. So if you're skinning and changing the look and feel of Sakai for your institution, this can give you a good starting place to find that information and a community support statement, which is with the advent of Sakai 12 series, official community support for Sakai 10 ceases. Um, so organizations running Sakai 10, 2, 9, and earlier are strongly encouraged to upgrade to the 12 series. Uh, so that's uh, an important statement. I would say that, uh, you know, that's really, it's important for the community to stay as close to the um, latest version as possible. Of course, understanding that we just released a 12.0, so people really haven't had time to make their plans to move to 12 yet. Plus, um, a lot of folks like to wait for one or two maintenance releases so things stabilize a little bit more before they adopt. But in general, getting up to the, to the more recent versions of Sakai is highly recommended because that's where um, the most current patches, bug fixes will be. That's where the security fixes will go first and um, most consistently. And as I mentioned, um, that readme part, I'm just going to give a high level of what's in the readme. Um, again, tried to, tried, I tried to capture things uh, that uh, have to do with change management, the things that you need to consider, change, big changes to the assignments tool, maybe some other features that are in Sakai that may not be obvious. They've been turned off by default uh, for various reasons, uh, maybe turned on at a later date. So it might be good to think about 
um, the value of those things to your institution and how you might want to help move things along so that those become more widely adopted in the community and better supported. Uh, details on the Sakai 12 properties. So every release, we have a thing called the Sakai.properties file. I'm happy to share a link to where that is located. It's completely out in the open. And every major release, we end up with new properties for new features that are in Sakai or new flexibility the developers have added so that institutions have an option of turning certain features on or off. Sometimes we have things that are off by default that we decide we've, we're going to turn on um, so they're more visible out of the box. Sometimes there are things that have been on by default, but we're going to turn them off because maybe there's performance issues or other or security concerns or what have you. So by default, we want to turn them off. So that detail of all those different properties, as many as um, we were able to capture is there. And um, in addition, I left here from previous releases information on sort of best practices, and maybe that should be broken out separately. Um, you know, recommend that I'm sure most institutions store files on their file system instead of using the database. Um, how does lessons manage HTML pages that might be a little different than other tools in Sakai, things like that. So that is the overall structure. And I'll take a breath here and just see if anyone has any questions about that before diving into more details on uh, features themselves. I went over that pretty quickly. I'm not seeing any feedback in the chat. Did I go through that a little too quickly or did that kind of make sense? I think that was a pretty good high level overview, Neil. We might want to wait just a couple minutes to see if anybody else has any comments on their mic or in the chat, but I think that was a great high-level overview of where those docs are and how to find them and dive into them if you want them or need them right now. Cool, and Adam seemed to like that too. Thanks, Adam. So um, yeah, feel free to ask questions as we move along. Um, so I'm going to go into more specifics now, and uh, you can read the new for Sakai 12 yourself. Um, you know, I, I can give a very high level. You can see there's uh, improved look and feel. You'll see that very obviously if you could, I guess a good thing to maybe post in the uh, minutes is that for those of you who may not be familiar, we have this page called nightly2.sakaiproject.org. We sometimes call these the nightly servers that get built automatically all the time. And we have a copy of the Sakai 12 official release in there with all the default properties. We have a, a link to the properties that are being set for 12. Um, we have master, which is going to be 13 at some point. That'll be the next major release. Uh, right now, 12 and 13 are pretty close because we just released 12. Um, so it's a great way to take a look if somebody wouldn't mind, uh, here, I'll paste it in the chat. Somebody wouldn't mind pasting it into the Etherpad, because if you want to take a look and play around yourself, that's a really great place to go. And um, um, and then you'll immediately see the differences. I think they'll very, very obvious differences in the look and feel. And that's one of the big changes for 12, a really beautiful and um, more functional look and feel overall. Um, there's great performance enhancements. Um, as I mentioned, there's a new tool, Commons tool, which I'll show in a second. Um, several major changes in tests and quizzes, uh, math jack support, and so forth. So take a look down that list as I'm presenting if you want to multitask and see if you have questions on any of those uh, pieces. Um, uh, and I'll move along. So one of the features I thought would be interesting to show, because it's not on by default, it does require um, setting some properties, and it does also have some potential really powerful ramifications for Sakai uh, 12 and beyond, is something called the tags feature. And the tags feature, the only place right now it's implemented is something called experimental trunk master on MySQL on our nightly servers. And what experimental trunk is master, and I know we have like three different names for the same thing, so I really apologize about that. <laughs> We've talked about that on the QA team, that that can be really confusing, uh, having multiple names for things. But this is essentially master, again, is the most recent version of Sakai, where developers are constantly putting in new bug fixes, constantly putting in new features. So it's the very, very latest, but it's not production ready. And um, that's why we, at some point, sort of make a copy of it, like we did with 12, and then get that stabilized and then release it. So on this experimental, what we do is that's a version of master, a version of the of the um, software that keeps updating that we 
play around with. We put special properties on there so we can play around and show them off. So the tags feature, I'll show you how you set it up briefly and show you what it looks like in Samago. Um, it's a way of being able to ta to organize um, questions and be able to then use a very structured way of discovering those for later. So um, under the admin tool, there should be a tags. And I don't see it, which I'm not surprised because these servers get built um, all the time. So what I'm going to do is go over to sites and I'm going to add it to the admin workspace. So I'm going to go to admin. This will just take me a second here maybe be behind the scenes look that uh, folks often don't get. I hope I'm able to add this quickly. Um, and if I can't, we'll skip it and I'll just talk about it. But add edit pages and add a new page. Title, um, tag service. Apologies, I meant to, uh, should have set this up probably in advance, but I said it should just take a minute click on new tool on this page and this is again I'm logged in as admin so this is purely for admin there's something called tag service and one of the things that's cool about tag service is I'm setting this up I'm gonna go ahead and save that and now it should show up under administration workspace one of the, oh, there was there. I should have looked in an <laughs> admin workspace ahead of time. So I've got two of them now. So the, one of the cool things about tag service, first of all, it's a way to struct, create a structure set of tags. I created one called Neil, Neil set of tags. You could create one, let's say for your medical school or maybe even, um, you know, different departments in your, in your um, institution, maybe will want to manage their own set of tags. And from manage tags, you can create your own, um, so I have bunny, doggy, horsey, sorry about that. I guess I was punchy yesterday afternoon when I set this up. Um, but you can set up your own tags and tags are just labels that you can use to uh, then literally tag questions in Samago test and quizzes in a structured way and be able to retrieve them in a structured way. And then you can create new tags and give them new labels, create new tag collections. They can be set up also, as I understand it, for with automated um, you know, an automated process to um, update your tags. I believe there's a way of doing that and keeping track of what the source of those uh, the, that data is. And th and there is actually some really good documentation. Um, I will drag that up before the end of the meeting and um, and paste that in the Etherpad because there's really great documentation about how the tag service works. And then I'm going to just quickly go into the front end and show what that looks like but not go into all the detail and the question is so tag service is only tied to test and quiz quiz questions thank you for that it's like i set you up to ask me that perfect question because one of the really thing cool cool things about the tag service is it was implemented as part of what we call the kernel so it's which is central services in Sakai. So theoretically, or probably in reality, um, if people like the tag service um, it could be extended to apply to other tools for example, I could imagine it being something that's useful for a forms tool. Yeah, so I think that's a really, really cool way that it was implemented to make it more of a central service and not just specific. Uh, only at, yes, only admins can create tags and or through, I believe there's um, hooks to do it through some automated processes so that you can have other sources of that data. But as far as I know, it's just for admins to create the tags. So I think it's something that's envisioned as something that's central. Now, once the service is there, if the community wants to evolve it, evolve it in a different direction, then they can, I imagine. But um, that's that's the way it works at the moment. Uh, let's see if I've got anything set up here. Take a look at one of these existing sites. So just to show you it, how it looks in test and quizzes, um, it looks like I it looks like the data was is still there from yesterday, which is great. So I'm going to click on edit and see it has tags. And when you edit a tag, uh, edit a question, and again, this has to be turned on. It's off by default. Um, you can start typing and it does a type ahead. And it notices that what I'm typing in is that because it's restricting me to exact, which is the nice thing about that is that you don't have to worry about misspellings. You don't have to worry about people creating tags in the fly that nobody understands what they are. So there's uh, a positive to that uh, structure. And then there's ways of searching and retrieving 
questions or things from question pools or from tests that um, are just related to those particular tags. And again, there's some really good documentation on Confluence on our Sakai Wiki, and I'll make sure to actually include that in the README file. I don't know if I put that in there, so make a note to myself. So that is just a very high level view of, of the tags feature. And I'm going to keep going on. I don't see any questions coming in, so I'll take a breath and uh, move on to the next feature that is not immediately obvious. Um, this is, I believe, in Sakai 12, like you don't have to do anything special to get this next tool. It's a new tool, um, and it's called the Commons tool. Uh, let's see. Oh, I probably should have. Uh, that's fine. I'll just go into one of these existing sites. I hope I'm not. Okay, let me uh, let me log into my own account here. We have kept the data around on this particular server. Oh, I could have gone on 12x. That's a great. Yeah, let me do this. I'll just go into my my space here, and. Um, I'm going to add in the Commons tool. So if you go to Manage Tools, there's a new tool called the Commons tool. It's a social networking style tool allowing posts with URL to thumbnail expansion and unthreaded replies. So it's kind of like a Facebook-like kind of way of interacting. Um, so I'd recommend kind of getting a demo site and playing around with it, I believe. Um, so here it is, the Commons tool. Oh, got to set permissions. Sorry about that. Let's say I'm instructor. So why it would have permissions where instructor can't even post, I have no idea. I'm just going to select everything for everybody so I don't have to think about it. Let's see, Jennifer writes, nice for question pools, but admin would need to work with users to set up. I have a few groups that would like it. Cool about the tags, I assume. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, I think the tags is going to be something where you're going to have to think through how you're going to want to manage that process. And Trisha writes about what I'm doing now, probably need to set up in Realms right, probably need to set it up in Realms, which is an admin function, so that the permissions get set automatically, or maybe there's some other way of, uh, in addition to having permissions set the way you want. So I'm not really paying attention, I'm just set it, selecting everything so we can quickly take a look. So it's just, it looks, you know, what's on your mind, uh, you can type stuff in. And I believe you can add in images, which I um, don't think I had planned exactly what I would use for an image. So this is dangerous. Let's see. Well, I found a dinosaur skull. Let's use that. And you can put URL links in, post that. And then as a student, I can come in here and I'll see this posting and then I can respond. Uh, I do have some students in here. So let me take a look quickly at a student view. Oh, I don't have a student in here. Let me add a student in. So we can see the student view of that. I see something coming in. Um, if I have update, delete, and edit should probably be tied to instructors, maintainer roles, not students and access roles. True. Yeah, absolutely, Tricia. I wasn't really paying attention to what I'm doing. I'm just kind of flying through. Uh, getting this to work, just uh, more of a fun demo, but not definitely should not. Uh, you should be you should be careful about what permissions that you assign to which roles. Um, now let me go in as a student. No, that's a good good point. Thank you about the permissions and getting that on the recording. Um, it's different from chat in that um, it's not intended to be as real time. And uh, I thought there was a reply piece here. So here's the one here. I guess it's more a linear thing. I thought there might be some, some reply. Oh, here we go. There's a reply. So it's kind of more Facebook style. It's a more intended uh, asynchronous kind of thing. Um, not as real time as uh, the chat. But that would be something to sort of explore. Uh, 
Yeah, more like a super, one says more like a super simple discussion forum, right? I think that's a good analogy. So it's something, it's a, it's a new tool. If it's somewhere in between the chat and the forums, it's something to play with and, and see if it would meet needs. Um, it's something where if you're not comfortable that it should, would be something you want to release to your institution, you could always turn it off. Um, not graded, right? I don't think it has grading connections like the forums tool does at this point. Um, and I also don't think that it works quite in real time like uh, the earmuffs. Oh, those aren't earmuffs. That's supposed to be like a little perf a little person with a um, a cap on them. See that in the in the white space? But I see how it looks like it's earmuffs. <laughs> so uh, that's great. Um, so yeah, so this is a tool I would recommend that you explore, take a look at. It doesn't update in real time like Facebook does, so you want to kind of figure out if it if it fits well for your institution or not. But by default, it is on. Um, and one that wouldn't maybe be immediately obvious. Uh, oh, why did I log off? We can look at lessons, I think, is something that most of our community by now is familiar with. Um, and it has a bunch of new little widgets in it that are kind of fun. Um, and one says it's a lot like comments and lessons page, the comments tools being a lot like lessons, uh, comments and lessons page. <laughs> so we'll add a lessons uh, here. The post from this get pushed to the bullhorn notification. I don't think so, Ben, but that we'll get to the bullhorns in a second and actually explain why bullhorns, the bullhorns academic and social notifications is turned off by default. It's uh, specifically because of questions sort of like that, uh, what should get turned on, what shouldn't be turned on for bullhorns. So um, I'm now regretting I didn't set up a sample lessons to show off some of these features ahead of time because that would be more efficient. I'm just going to watch the time here. Um, See. I just have a quick um, announcement regarding bullhorns. Yeah. Um, I forgot to announce it earlier when you guys were asking for announcements, but we're doing the, the third um, bellwether session next week on um, the 11th, I think. Is it, is it? Let me just double check. Um, yes, the 11th. So a week from today and part of the topic is going to be about notifications and you know how users are kept up to date so we'll probably be talking a little bit about bullhorns and what sorts of events need to be there um, for it to be a little more robust so if you're interested in that feel free to register it's um, still open for registration right thank you for that yeah and that's exactly what i was going to mention and we'll show we'll talk just briefly about bullhorns as well um, and what those notifications are but that's exactly why they're not turned. That's why they're turned off by default in 12, because it the community felt like we needed to assess which um, notifications should be going and which shouldn't be going to that to that system. So we'll talk about that in just a second here. Um, under the uh, uh, let's see, I'm not seeing the resources one. Um, there's some new widgets added. There's uh, the same ones you're used to plus you know links to forums links to tests and quizzes links to assignments but you can also embed announcements you can embed forum conversations um there's also one oh here we go add resources folder so if we have something in our resources tool we can embed a whole folder and it can display the contents of the folder so all kinds of new little widgets to play with that enhance the capability of the lessons tool uh, without going into a lot of detail there's also a cool feature that takes a twitter feed unfortunately i think we turned that off by default because um it wasn't working on master so there's at least the structure and of a uh, twitter feed one um available and if the community was interested in kind of looking at that and that was uh, a priority i'm sure that could get fixed and wilma put in the link to the bellwether series um in the chat and i'm hoping also in the uh etherpad so people can look at that so some cool new stuff there um there's also a new um widget like in the overview area where this used to just display uh, the site info, it now has its own site widget tool. Um, so you can have more flexibility and the full CK editor there. I believe this is new. I got a little confused myself when I was looking at the feature because I'm doing so much testing in 12. I compared it to 11 and it looked like this was sort of new, that the old site info was more pulling from the site information from the site info de description that you create here. In this area 
And it appears that the new site info, if I'm not mistaken, lets you have a whole different area to edit and put images and information uh, for your site. I think they're separate. That's, you know, I didn't have time to research it a little more, but I believe they're separate now, that there's two different things. So that would be something to, what does the other one do? Good question. I, I don't know. I imagine it would be pretty easy to use the other one and put it on this overview page if you want to continue using it. But yeah, I don't I don't know all of these features and all the detail, but we maybe want to create some some questions and maybe put some of those questions on the etherpad that we could look into as a community and get a little more clarity or if somebody on the call happens to know uh for example uh you know we're we're um well we'll just chimed in a second ago on some issues on the comments tool so we can kind of use community power to answer those uh, so that's something to look at um and as I mentioned, a uh, big, big feature, but don't have time to, to do it, to show it in detail is, um, do I have any public? Let me go here and just look at settings. Uh, one of the biggest features, I think, for the 12 release, in addition to the overall look and feel being more beautiful and functional, is this whole concept of exceptions to time and date delivery, where you can set for either a number of individual users um, or and or groups, and you can have multiple of these. Um, there's the overall site, uh, test release information. When is this uh, test available? When is it due? Um, am I gonna? What's the time limit to take the test? Uh, are late submissions accepted until when? You can override all those settings for individuals or groups, and um, we've tested that with auto submit and with timers. It seems to work pretty well. Um, and so this could be very powerful, right? Then you don't need to create a different, if you have a different group, for example, if you have a group of um, learners who have um, dyslexia that you want to give them more time, for example, you could create a group for them uh, and give them a different set of parameters for taking the exam or other disabilities or issues. So um, we did a lot of testing on it. I'm sure we could use a lot more, but we did a lot of testing in that area and it seemed like it worked pretty well. So I'd encourage you to explore that. Um, let's see, IMS shopping cart. So this is one where I don't fully grok, uh, meaning I don't fully understand exactly how this will be used, but it looks really intriguing and interesting and worth some uh, exploration. So anywhere there's a um, CK editor. Oh, oh, I actually should mention something really cool about the CK editor before I go on. Uh, which is, I think this is really cool. Um, as you all know, the rich text editor, which is also called the CK editor, um, there's now a new editor preference. And you can choose to have it automatically detect based on your browser size, um, whether how many of those little widgety tools that you have available, um, or you can force a very basic mobile view or give a full desktop with all those buttons and all those features. So there's um, you know, very powerful. This could be very powerful for folks who have accessibility um, issues. Um, it also has improved um, the mobile interface quite a bit. And it's, uh, so that's a cool feature, I think. Um, coming back to the announcements. So looking at any place there's a CK editor, we now have this new little shopping cart tool. And this shopping cart tool, is an LTI-ish kind of app store feature. And I noticed that there were some things plugged into this test environment. Oh, is it also in 11 already? I missed that, that this got in there. So it's in yours. Okay, so I'll need to double check. I thought this was a 12 thing. Sometimes people backport ish, um, features that are in 12 and backport them to 11 and you don't have it. So I think it's a 12 thing that some maybe some folks have already backported. And here's an example of connecting it with Sugi and providing all these different uh, links to tools um, that are available. So like an app store type of environment. Um, I'm not familiar with the exact way that this is configured and set up, but it looks like an exciting sort of evolution for being able to set up an app store, set up a place where you have a number of tools available that are available to people. They can just link them in from anywhere in Sakai. And we can recognize Dr. Chuck's uh, handwriting on this set of uh, features here. So that's one that can be fun to explore. Um, 
Okay, a couple, so I think now I'll move on and looking at the time, um, 10.41 or 10 so. I'm going to move back, uh, I'm going to take a breath and see if there were any other questions or any other features or areas of tools that people had questions on. I've been monitoring the chat. If not, I'll try and, how much time do you think I should spend, Matt, uh, maybe another eight minutes or so to wrap up and give or time for uh, at the end? Yeah, I think that sounds good, Neil. Maybe another eight or nine minutes or so. I've seen, you know, a lot of comments in the chat, a lot of excitement about the new uh, options in the tests and quizzes tool, allowing you to offer extended time or different settings to specific students. I know that's something that we often get requests about here at UVA, and I'm sure that other people get similar requests at other institutions. So that's definitely a great feature. Uh, but yeah, if you want to take maybe eight or nine more minutes, and then uh, we can talk about some possible topics for our next set of meetings going forward and just wrap things up, I think that sounds great. Okay, cool. Um, so let me keep going then here. Uh, so now what I'm going to shift over to is, is talking about some of the change management pieces um, in 12 that are... Uh, ones that at least I was able to identify and I can explain a little bit about the process of how I tr tried to keep track of these things um, so the community could keep trying to you know keep track of these things for future releases um, what I did basically was use a document a label called document all lowercase on Jira so as Jira's came through that I thought there might be a chance that there'll be something important to talk about on that issue and include in the release notes I would just use that label and then at the end I went through all those to get this list of issues and of course I would then uh, talk with developers to get more clarification and with other folks to uh, to see if um, we're on target with these um, with these issues so in assignments assignments had a complete rewrite in the back end and um, as a result of that rewrite it the benefit of that is over the future it should make it uh, much easier to add in new features and to fix bugs it's a much more efficient database schema behind the scenes but there was some fallout from from doing that um, and here's a few things there's a submission history so we got some screenshots here that has been removed so people used to seeing this history so an instructor after resubmitting a student assignment would see a history uh, the history data is still there behind the scenes but this front end display is not there and students viewing grades from the instructor um, they would see a history piece that part is also missing from 12 compared to 11. Um, it's possible to reconstitute it or to create a new feature that would be even better and do a better job of communicating the history of an assignment submission. Um, but at the moment in 12.0, uh, that particular feature is gone and it's not in 12.1 either. Um, site archive, because the structure, the data structure of um, assignments changed so much that there's no longer compatibility if you archive something in 11 that has assignments in it and then you try and restore it to 12 you will run into problems i believe there are workarounds uh, for that um, but they're fairly technical at the moment no real simple um, you know button that you press to, to get that import so that's important to be aware of um, and another one i think is really important is that for attachment only assignments for assignments where most the default is inline and attachment assignments um, where you can, as a student, either type in your response in the CK editor, in the rich text editor, and or upload an attachment, perhaps a Word document. Um, for assignments that are attachment only, the ability to have the CK editor was, um, let's say, student must upload a file. The link, there's no links accepted. The concern was of a security concern that uh, students can easily, for example, if the instructor is not really paying attention, they could put a link in the current version to uh, a Google Doc, for example, and even after doing a submission, could still keep updating their Google Doc, um, and it's dynamic. So that's an important one to pay attention to and look at um, if you know of um, instructors of classes that might be using that kind of workflow. We talked a little bit about bullhorn notifications, really cool feature uh, for, which we don't have time to really show, at the, um, running out of time, but it has uh, little icons at the top of the screen, uh, up, it would be up in this area. Um, for social notifications, if you make connections with other students or instructors um, and write them, you know, 
uh, connect with each other through that way. And also so academic notifications, which are things like a new assignment's been posted, a new test and quiz has been posted. So that is in there. It does work well. The reason, as we alluded to earlier, it's been turned off by default is because we really wanted to have a thorough community review of is it capturing all things out of the box that we would expect academic notifications to have? Is it having some things that are duplicate and we're concerned about the duplications, make sure that those aren't there. So a uh, really cool feature. Um, it needs just some uh, love and attention to get it in shape and make sure the right set of um, notifications is, is um, set up for out of the box. Let's see, uh, I see some chat going on there. Uh, so I will just keep going and answer questions at the end. Um, there's a new course management, sysload, using CSV files. MathJax, I mean, real big improvement in MathJax. Um, it's much easier to use now because you have a little site level setting in site info versus uh, tool by tool. That's easy, really easy to show. I um, believe it's, it's not there. Let's see. Um, Manage tools, maybe. Okay, I'm not. F oh, there we go. So, under manage tools, or when you're creating the site, enable MathJax for automatic rendering. Click it, boom. Oh, and that's another cool new les lessons things I forgot to mention. Subpage navigation you can turn on, which is really cool, because then when you create subpages in the left hand menu, it'll show those subpages uh, underneath the main lessons page. That's a really cool one too, and just a click of a button, and you have that feature available. So two really cool new um, simple features in. I mean, MathJax isn't technically new, but it's um, just e a lot easier to use in twelve. And the sub lesson subpage navigation is another cool tool. Um, so a lot of things I recommend you uh, look at in here. Um, the syllabus, the editing process has changed, uh, and that's because we have some technical debt in the syllabus tool. That's another big community discussion is, do we want to do something different for our syllabus going forward? Um, Christina asks, can the subpage navigation be turned on, off in properties? I think so, but I'm not sure. If you wouldn't mind putting that as a question in the etherpad. Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, just site by site is the only way available and it's available for all courses or if there's any way to turn that off I'm not not really sure so take a look if your institution uses syllabus um, there's some technical debt there and the way that you edit your syllabus items now is something called bulk edit which has always been there we're gonna try and get the name change to that to just say edit so that's a big change in syllabus and we've had a lot of discussions in the community around um, the future of the syllabus tool or whether it should be replaced by something like templates in lessons or some other way so just be aware that of this readme section and some important change uh, changes there. And then I'm just going to show you some things where you could go and kind of explore on your own. As I mentioned, if we go back to the functional release notes and you go near here, it says complete feature summary. It says, I think it's complete. I certainly try to make every component visible here. Um, So this is broken down by tool by tool, component by component. What are the potential new features or tasks or um, technical debt uh, that was fixed in each area? So if we click on announcements, it goes to the announcements area. Um, this first one here, I uh, already showed you the create user preference panel for the CK editor. Um, when you see these, some of these have like, it's, it's not showing all the issues. So if you see something like showing five of 13 issues, you can simply click on the 13 issues and for assignments, for example, see all 13 issues that potentially are uh, feature enhancements for, um, for uh, the assignments tool. So you can, I think that's a really great way as you're kind of assessing your change management needs for your institution, where you can kind of maybe assess things based on the tools that you use the most um, or check on things that you might not be familiar with. It's a really, really quick way to get an idea of what new features are in each tool. Um, some other things that are pretty big content review, there's, there's uh, if you do use content review like Turnitin or Verisite, there's um, an update to the, uh, that was just went out over the uh, listserv and also it will be updated on the community wiki about you know, what the current state of the content review is. There were some important improvements in 12, um, but people have also been waiting for an LTI version of Turnitin, and that is sort of under the works. So we're not gonna get into all the detail there. 
Um, so that kind of, uh, I think, covers all the main points that um, I was hoping to cover. And I hope that was of uh, use to everybody. What is the best 12 environment nightly to use to play with these new features? Yes, good question. I would say uh, that's a very good question. Um, we have several 12 environments up on here, so uh, they're going to be very close to each other. Um, right now, the 12.0 official release, you can certainly play on there. Um, we're going to have 12.1 out pretty soon. So if you played on the maintenance branch, that would give you that uh, um, experience. The difference between them is that the maintenance branch is the data gets wiped every uh, night, whereas on this version, it keeps the data. So that way, if you want to test things over multiple days, it's probably better to use this uh, official release one, which will then get updated to RCO one pretty soon for 12.1, then the 12.1 official release. Um, and Wilma points out for bullhorns, you have to use experimental. Um, and uh, that's right. So we set for, for that feature, you have to go to the master because it's not turned. It is in 12, but it's not turned on for 12 by default. And for schools that have a little more technical savvy, you know, downloading a copy of Sakai uh, 12 locally, you can play with the properties yourself and turn features on and off. And it does make me think there was a question about um, properties. Let me just see. Because uh, it was a question about the lessons. So let me see if lessons properties is under properties real quickly. It's properties, right? Yep, there we go. Um, about the sub pages. So I'm not at least, uh, at least what was captured here, I'm not seeing a property to turn off the subpage uh, for lessons, but that might need a little more um, investigation. I think you can turn it on for the site. Yep. But it's off by default. But yes. You go to site info, that's where you turn it on. Right. I think the question, if I was not, if I was understanding it or guessing at it, was whether it was possible to turn off subpage use for the whole, for for a whole, you know, for all of Sakai or institution. That's what I was interpreting that as meaning, and that I don't know. But yeah, otherwise it's site by site. You turn it on, and it's off by default. Okay, not seeing any other questions come in. I guess we will uh, wrap up for now. So thank you everyone for your attention and indulgence. Thanks, Neil. This has been really great. I mean, there's so many new things going on here in Sakai 12 that, you know, it's hard to get even a 30,000 foot overview of everything that's going on in this new release, but we've managed to cram a whole lot of stuff into about 30 or 40 minutes. So thanks so much, Neil, for sharing some of your expertise with us as you've kind of guided this release, you know, from beginning to end. You have really an unparalleled understanding of everything that's going on under the hood. So we see a lot of people in the chat expressing their thanks, and let me do that on the recording also. Thank you so much for showing us all this stuff that we're going to get to dive in and play with over the next few months as our various institutions upgrade to Sakai. That's really great. And Neil, in the meantime, over the next couple of weeks, if people are interested in diving in and testing specific features and they don't see those features available on the nightly server where they're looking, what should they do about that? Should they reach out and contact you? Can they send you an email and ask you about that? Or should they just move to the experimental trunk server if they don't see a feature immediately available? What would you recommend that they do if they're interested in kind of diving in and looking at maybe a specific feature? Sure. So yeah, experimental is not a bad, bad, bad place to look at all. And if it does work on experimental for you, if you're able to find it and not able to find it on one of the other instances, then what you can do is look in the experimental Sakai properties um, because it's just a link right off of right on that row um, next to the server on the same line. And um, you can probably find the property there. I would say since uh, my position is uh, going away, we probably should check with the core team. There's a couple of possible ways I could imagine making that request. Um, one is the core team directly or possibly putting in an infrastructure 
uh, a request in JIRA. We have an infrastructure project. I think one of the tri tricky things is that we like to have the version of we like to have the version of the software that's going to be the set of properties that's on by default out of the box. So when people are playing with these QA servers, um, you know they know what to expect. Although we do sometimes also turn properties on specifically so we can test them because we want to make sure that if somebody turns them on that they work and if not that we can include that warning that you know please don't turn this on because it hasn't had sufficient testing so um, I would say that's a really uh, uh, let me check with the core team and um, but that would be my recommendation is to check with the core team because my because uh, my position's going away I wouldn't want to volunteer to be the point person because that would only be for this month Sure, absolutely. Okay, so Wilma has a brief announcement in the chat. Uh, just an FYI that our next uh, UX group meeting is today at 11 o'clock, so right after we finish up here in Big Blue Button Room 3. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in discussing Sakai UI UX, uh, please feel free to join Wilma and that group at 11 o'clock uh, in Big Blue Button Room 3. We're seeing more thanks in the chat for a great presentation. So just a quick update on our calls going forward. Our next three calls are currently scheduled to be April the 18th, which is two weeks from today, May the 2nd, and May the 16th. Currently, all three of those dates are open. We don't have any presentations scheduled for those dates. I could see you know, one or more of us maybe taking one of those slots to dive in and talk a little bit more about some of these updates and lessons, for example. I know I'm certainly interested in that, and I would certainly be willing to maybe take some time and work with Neil and some other folks to put together something in lessons to go through that in more detail. But I'm sure that there are many different things that have occurred to you all about possible topics that you might like to see discussed more on a teaching and learning call. So if you have any ideas or any requests for meeting topics for any of those three dates, April 18th, May the 2nd, or May the 16th, uh, please feel free to send any of us uh, an email. I've pasted my chat, um, I've pasted my email address right there. It's uh, Matthew.Burgess at Virginia.edu. So please feel free to uh, send me an email if you have any requests or any ideas for topics for any of those dates. Uh, Terry has uh, pasted something in the chat uh, requesting a report on uh, the level access report. I think that's a great idea. Um, obviously, we have a shortcut to that around here because Tiffany, who leads that accessibility group, works here at UVA. So we may be able to force her to meet with us because she can't escape me. She's one cubicle over. Just just to put in a plug for that, we need a little bit more time to assess the report and decide on on whether what actions seem to be taken. So it, it's still a few weeks away, I think, before we could do that. So we may need to wait just a little bit, but I agree, Terry, that's a great idea and something that we will want to talk about just whenever it's available. So I will add that to my notes. And Beth comments in the chat that additional info about lessons updates would be helpful. So maybe that's something that we can uh, look at as one of our first upcoming topics. And again, if you have other things that occur to you, you know, throughout your week, things that come up as you're working with your instructors at your institutions, please feel free to send any of us facilitators an email, and I've pasted my email there in the chat. And Trisha comments, we need presenters for lessons. You know, I'm happy to dive in and play around and put something together as a demo, but it would be great um, if other folks were interested in participating in that as well. So if you love lessons like I love lessons, and like many of us love lessons and want to dive in and be a part of that, um, please feel free uh, to send me an email uh, or uh, connect with me on uh, the teaching and learning channel that we have in Slack. And more thanks for Neil, uh, thanks from URI, and from all of us. So thanks again, Neil, for taking the time to do this. It's 11 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, again, please feel free to check out the Etherpad notes. Uh, there are some valuable links there, and sign in on the Etherpad if you haven't done so already. We will be in touch with all of you um, regarding the topics for our next call, which is two weeks from today, Wednesday, April the 18th. So thanks again, everybody for coming out and joining us today, and we will look forward to seeing you right here in two weeks. Have a good one.